Okay. So, if we remember our TDD cycle, red, green refactor. Do we need to do any refactoring at the moment? Well, our test code here isn't really as clean as it could be. Our first two test methods are pretty readable, but this last test we added is certainly a lot longer than the other two. And whilst it might not be too bad at the moment, when we've only got a few tests, if you can imagine a, a system building up over time, you certainly don't want to be dealing with a lot of test methods that are going to take you a lot of time to read. You want to be able to glance at the test method and tell what it's testing, what behaviour it's executing, and what assertions it's making about that behaviour. So let's look at ways we can we can improve this test method here. There are a few ways we could do this. So one way I found works well is rather than having a, a separate test class for every class you want to be testing, having a one-to-one -one relationship, is actually to have a different test class depending on the initial state that you want your class under test to be in. So what does that mean for this test? Well, looking at these tests here, we've got two tests, our first two, which are all about testing how a new calculator behaves. And this more recent test is about testing how a calculator behaves once we've entered a number of values, three in this case. So how about we split our test in two? So we have a test for a new calculator and a test for a calculator that's already had these values entered. So we're splitting up that test setup. So let's see what this could look like. First thing we'll do is rename our, our calculator test. This is going to become our test for a newly created calculator. So we'll do a, a simple rename. And what we want to be doing is pulling this large test here out into a new test class. So let's just cut that code a second and create a new test class. Okay, regular Java class, and our test folder, and this will be a calculator that's got three values already set on it. So this might sound a little long-winded, but it's really important to keep these test classes descriptive. So at a glance, you should be able to get an idea of what this test class is, what the methods within it are going to be testing. Okay, so let's paste in our, our test body. Very first thing obvious in the compiler is we haven't got our, our calculator field, so let's set that up now. So we'll create a test setup method as before, but the, the setup method in this case is going to set our calculator up with all of those three values already on the stack. Okay, so let's create our calculator as before. This time the test setup we're currently doing in this test method, that is pushing those three values in the stack, we want to move that into our setup. So let's take all of this and move it out. Okay, to make testing our values easier in our test method, let's change these from local variables to fields in the class. Okay, so let's run our tests, make sure everything's still passing. Okay, great, we've got two test classes now. Uh, our test method's a bit smaller than it was before, a bit more readable, and all our tests are passing, so we've not broken our test at all here. But this test method's still, still not too great. Looking at what it's doing, it's making three separate assertions, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's actually executing the drop method several times. It's involving separate pieces of behavior on our, our calculator. It's far cleaner, I find, to and far more maintainable to have separate test methods where each one is testing a distinct piece of functionality or a distinct piece of behavior on your class under test. So thinking about what we're testing here, we're testing the accumulator on the calculator 
once those three values have been pushed into the stack. We're then testing the accumulator value once we've performed a single drop. And finally, we're testing the accumulator value once we've performed two drops. So that sounds to me like it should really be three tests rather than one, one larger test here. So let's just split these up. So after pushing the three values in the stack, we want to be making this assertion here, making sure that the accumulator has value 3. Now we want to be testing the accumulator after a single drop. Let's move this code from that other method app here. And our final test, this should be testing our accumulator value after two drops. Okay, so we've ended up, instead of one test method, testing three pieces of behaviour, we've now got three separate test methods where it's clear from both the name and also the content what each one is going to be testing. So let's just run our tests, make sure they're still passing. Yes, they do, which is great. Okay, so we've now seen how, using a test-driven approach, we can build up functionality in our calculator class. We've seen how, on a couple of occasions, we can refactor our test code once we've written our tests and got them passing. Now let's just revisit our calculator code itself a sec. So it's admittedly not doing too much at the moment. But most of what it is doing is actually about using the Java stack. So the, the stack that we're using is not really best suited to our purposes here. The, the Java stack, as we saw before, threw exceptions when it was empty, was we really want a stack that has a default value of zero. We just want a stack of big decimals with a default of zero when it's empty. So rather than leave the calculator as it is, let's look at creating a new stack which is more tailored to our purposes. It's going to allow our calculator code to remain cleaner as we start to build more functionality, such as the ability to actually calculate things. So we could take a, a couple of approaches here, but using a, a test-driven approach, we know we want to create this new stack class, but we need to test for it first before we can create it. So let's go back into our package explorer and create a new test class. Okay, so what are we calling our test class? Well, we're going to be creating a new stack, but what, what type of stack is it? It's not a, a generic stack anymore. What we actually want is a, a stack of operands. So, stands to reason, I have an operand stack test class. Okay, so let's look at adding our first test, which is going to force us to initially create and then flesh out our operand stack. So first thing we added before initially was the test for the default value. So we expect our operand stack, there's nothing on it, it's been newly created. We expect the peak when we look at the top of the stack, we expect that to always give us zero. So let's add a simple test for this. Again, a a slightly long-winded test name, but I think it's it's pretty descriptive, and that's that's something to always aim for, as you said before, with our test classes. So looking pretty similar to our our previous test. This time it's it's more stack oriented, so it's a stack peak. And now we can see here we're left with an operand stack class that we haven't got. So let's use the quick fix again and create our, our new operand stack class.
Okay, so going back to our test code, let's see another compile error. Haven't got our peak methods. Let's just create that now. Okay, so let's run our test. Okay, so as expected, our test is now failing. I'm expecting the value to be zero, but it's null. So we'll go back to our application code and flesh out the minimal implementation we need at this stage. Whilst this may seem a bit repetitive considering we've implemented something pretty similar to this already, using the, the TDD approach to flesh out our implementation, this really ensures that we're not going to be implementing anything that we haven't tested. Okay, so let's run our test. Now passes. So back to the stack test to add the, the next test we need to drive out that proper functionality as before. So, this time we want to be able to push a new value onto the stack. Okay, so test pushing a new value onto the stack. So again as before, let's just extract this to a separate field, add the appropriate test setup method. Okay, so let's push a value onto our stack. Okay, so let's push the value onto our stack and assert that the peak now returns this new value. Okay, so as before, we've got a, a compile error now. So again, we're not going to implement the body of that method yet. Let's make sure we've got our failing test first. Okay, so we've got our failing test, so let's go go ahead and implement this code now. So as before, it makes sense for this to be back by the Java stack. We're not going to implement our own stack from scratch here. So we just wanted a, a better API or a better separation of concerns between our calculator code itself and the stack that it's using. Okay, so peak can just be a values.peak. Okay, and the push can just be a simple values.push. Nothing too tricky here. Running our test, you can see we suffered the same problem we did previously. We've ignored the empty stack case again. So let's just fix our, our peak here. Turning our default value of zero. Running our tests again, you can see we're back to a passing state. Okay, so I think we can now move on with our stack functionality. So what else do we want to be able to do? What do you want to be able to do with our operand stack? Well, one key feature is to be able to replace the value at the top of the stack. That's what our accumulator is going to be based on, the value at the top of the stack. Let's add a test method for this. Okay, so this time we want to be able to push a, a value on the stack as before. But now we want to test replacing that value with another one. Okay, so let's replace the value at the top of the stack and now add an assertion to make sure that the, the peak is going to give us our new value instead. 
Okay, so again, back to test not compiling. Create the method. And let's make sure our test fails. Okay, so great, test failing. So now we can go ahead and implement our, our replace top method here. Okay, so what do we want to be doing here? We want to be replacing the value at the top of the stack. So let's take the current value off the top of the stack and push the new value onto it. Okay, running our test again. Okay, we can see this now passes. Now one obvious issue, as we saw before with our previous test code, was the values.pop would throw an exception if the stack was empty. So we could just add a test here. We, we do know that that is going to happen. If the stack's empty, this will throw the exception. But we want to be sticking to our TDD approach. So we want to be creating a failing test first and then fixing this issue and then watching that test go green again. So back to our test class. Test replacing top with empty stack. So this will look similar to our, our previous test, but we're not going to do this initial push at the top. Okay, so let's try running this test. Okay, now we're seeing a failure. We're seeing the empty stack exception that we expected. So now we can quickly go back to our operand stack and fix this problem. Run the test again. And we can see we're now passing. So we've now used TDD to, to address that issue. Okay, so we've now got a, an operand stack which we can peek at the value at the top of the stack. It's got the default value of zero. We can push new values on and we can replace the value at the top. So the obvious missing function now is the pop. We need to get a drop values from the stack. Let's create a test for this then. Okay, so let's create our, our test value. Let's push another value onto the stack too. Let's ask the stack to pop that value and we should be left with our original value as the value at the top of the stack. Let's just paste that assertion there, there we go. Okay, same deal as before. Create a missing method. See if our test fails. Okay, great, fails as expected. Fix the implementation. Now we should see our test pass. Okay, so again, looking at this, we can see we've got a bit of an issue here again with the pop. We're not testing the size. Okay, so same deal as before. Let's have that failing test. Test popping an empty stack. So in our case, we don't want the exception. We want to be able to pop for an empty stack. And when we ask it to peak, we expect it to return the default value of zero. Okay, so let's just check that the value is now zero. Okay, so let's run this test. Now failing as we expect with the empty stack exception. So we can now go ahead and add that test. Running our test code again, we can see it now passes. Okay, so we're now pretty happy with the, the behavior of our stack. So following that TDD cycle of red green refactor, we can see there's not too much here, but there is a, a minor refactor we can make. So 
here you can see we're doing exactly the same thing as the pop method so let's just replace that with a simple call run our tests again and verify that it's all still working so okay it's a, a trivial refactor but it it does demonstrate how TDD can be used to actually perform this refactoring operation safely okay so we've now got our operand stack currently it's completely separate from the calculator itself so let's look at swapping implementations in our calculator so now we've got the operand stack test we're pretty happy that our stack is going to work we'd hope we can just drop it in now and it's going to work exactly as it should do so let's give that a go Okay, so as expected, a whole bunch of compile errors. Let's just fix this now. So the accumulator is simply, the new stack is simply a, a peak. Set accumulator, this logic can be replaced with the replace top. Enter is simple push as before. And the drop, again, simple pop as it was before. Okay, got one warning here, which is just that we're not using the, the import here, so let's just sort that out. Okay, now we can run our, run our tests again and see if our, our calculator does indeed behave as it did before, before the refactor. Okay, great, so test still passing, so we've performed a refactor, we've implemented our new stack using a test-driven approach, and we've then used our existing test that we created for the calculator as a regression, so allowing us to refactor the calculator itself to use this new implementation. Okay, we're going to leave this video here for now. Um, in the next one, we're going to actually make our calculator calculate something, look at adding some simple operations.